So, Vladislav, now I want to turn to you, please. Vladislav Finozemtsev, uh, uh, from where you sit, how do you see this, this whole conversation? Uh, thank you so much. Um, it was a very interesting question and a very interesting topic. Uh, and I reflected on this. I would say, first of all, that uh, to me, uh, the question of new order uh, seems to be more a question of a new framework. Because uh, the word order is, I think, too strong to, uh, for describing the current economic condition. So the frameworks for economic uh, cooperation, for economic competition, they have changed many times since uh, in the last 100 years. And so what I see these days uh, is that the globalization and you know what is called the end of history, the unification of the world, which was also cited by, uh, with, uh, by Mr. de Montreal uh, in our opening session, is a little bit exhausted uh, because no order can, I think, persist uh, without, uh, no order can be universal. And so the major, I would say, challenge for the globalization is its own globality. Because the world is too different, the many parts of it, it uh, they are too different from each other uh, to be ruled and to be governed with uh, one set of rules. So therefore, I think that what we are seeing now is not so much uh, uh, the emergence of multipolarity and global competition between different centers of power, uh, but rather a new kind of regionalization inside a mostly globalized world. Uh, this uh, regionalization would uh, be managed by the major economic powers, for example, United States and Europe on the one hand, and China on the other hand. On the other hand, but it would not be so much political differences, but econ difference in economic models. So uh, it's not about you know Asian century or Pacific century against Atlantic century. It's more about you know information and post-industrial economy against uh, more traditional. Uh, commodity economy or industrial one. And uh, therefore, I would say that uh, United States and Europe will uh, major, uh, may, I would say, rely on their uh, innovative economy, on production of uh, sophisticated uh, and high profile goods which actually underline uh, maybe not superiority, but so kind of self-expression of the people. So when you look on the United States these days, the most successful, com uh, successful company is uh, Tesla and SpaceX, which actually embodies innovation. If you look on Europe, the biggest uh, European company by capitalization is LVMH, uh, which actually uh, specializes on producing unique and specialized goods, uh, embodied, embodying creativity of the European people. So. Uh, my point here is that uh, Europe and the United States will produce an economic model which is based on, I would say, first of all, the sense of belonging to some, uh, you know, maybe golden billion or whatsoever, and on self-expression, uh, while China and most of Asia will pursue the economic model built on mass production of cheap and qu high quality goods, which would have a huge demand for them in, all, in, in many parts of the world, which are not so much, uh, not, not, so, uh, not so wealthy as uh, Europe or the United States. And therefore, I think this model can coexist for a while, and they co can compete, uh, they can expand their sphere, the region of influences, uh, without uh, engaging in kind of political confrontation, which was very uh, obvious and very uh, often seen in, in the 20th century. I would also point out that um, this uh, competition between, uh, I would say, information and post-industrial uh, countries and uh, resource-oriented economies and industrial economies uh, will uh, definitely result in much, uh, I would say, in many rounds of this competition. Because uh, what we are talking about is a kind of catching up development and I would say that since 1930s, uh, there was no any change in uh, the first economy in the world. The United States led the world uh, for around 100 years. Before, it was very natural, you know, when France overtook Holland, when Britain overtook 
France, when Germany arrived as a huge industrial power, and then the United States came. But for the last 100 years, there were a lot of attempts to challenge this uh, hegemony, like by the Soviet Union in the 70s, by Japan in the 80s, and now by China. And so therefore, I wouldn't say that we are now approaching some new economic order, because uh, for this to happen, it should be a proof that some country can overtake the leader, which is, uh, you know, I would say the United States or uh, the Atlantic civilization. It's hard to believe that it can, can happen because everyone, uh, if one remembers the end of the 80s, everybody says about the end of the Cold War, about the dissolution of the Soviet Union, but the economic shock in Japan was actually have, have, had happened at the same time. So in the, eight of, uh, in the late 80s, uh, the whole industrial system went into crisis, both in its Soviet version and its Japanese version. And this was the first step of new economic reality. So I would say, I, I would finalize that uh, I cannot see the new economic order emerging. I can see another, you know, circle of economic change uh, approaching, but this will not be a new order. This will be different frameworks, different models competing with each other, and uh, it's very nice to say that uh, these days economic issues and economic power right. is actually more significant than political and military one, uh, which is uh, quite contrary to what we have seen in the early 20th century. So hopefully this transition, whatever it might be, would be more peaceful and more complex than it was uh, before and during the First or the Second World War. Thank you very much. So you, you've got this vision of multiple coexisting frameworks that sort of govern relationships amongst groups of countries. And I think that will raise the question of whether countries will be forced to be part of one framework or the other, or whether they can be part of multiple frameworks at the same time, and mm -hmm. whether countries are willing and ready to be forced to take sides and join one framework or the other. And I think maybe when we come to Madame Touré, I mean, in a way, in Africa today, a big issue for many countries is that they're being asked to take sides and, and they don't want to. So how does one manage that as well? Uh, we'll come to that. Uh